marginalized lives over the long haul of the years. When employment goes up, crime goes down. More jobs, less recidivism. Let's fix what needs to be fixed and concentrate on the positive changes that can be made in the lives of those we serve. Time does not permit me to stand here, or sit here rather, and catalog all of the dramatic improvements that these incentives have brought, but I see all of these possibilities through the lens of civil rights, social justice, and equal opportunity. Improvements to education and public safety are civil rights and matters of social justice, not to mention the fact that they are building blocks of a community. Building a long-term economy is the greatest insurance against poverty. With a strong economy comes access to opportunity for employment. There is no better social program in this world than a job. Employment training and placement of residents in these cities is a key issue we must continuously focus on. I would hope that in the SOPs we could focus on five employment categories in our continued efforts. First, our high school graduates who are not ready to go to college. Second, our individuals who are looking for fresh opportunities and a new start in life. Third, our displaced workers. Fourth, our college graduates who are residents in these cities. And finally, those who have been cast aside because they have some sort of criminal record. No particular category is more important than the other. As you consider uh, the next phase of the tax incentive program, I hope you will make local employment a focal point. The NAACP National Office has just announced a nationwide incentive called the Million Jobs Campaign, and it is, its focus is implementing fair chance hiring, which will provide employment opportunities more specifically for those who have a blemish on their record. And when we are successful with this initiative, we can transform our communities. The fact that 30 companies are or have come to Camden or are expanding their operations in the city is a good sign and why we feel we need as the NAACP to take a hands-on approach. In fact, the NAACP along with five other nonprofits in the city uh, have become a part of Camden Works, a program designed specifically to ensure that residents have an opportunity to become gainfully employed and the companies moving into the city. I applaud the progress that has already been made in this regard, and I think this is a good starting point and not the end objective. I think we all agree on that. Well, we could sit here and tout progress, but let's, let's let this whole piece be the beginning. Let's ensure we do more because the goal must ultimately be prosperity for all. We must all remember that coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, and working together is ultimately success. Thank you, Senator. So in, uh, so one comment uh, for Mr. Smith, the, um, we hope to be going forward with new legislation. It'd be really helpful if the, we could include in that legislation some of the things that the NAACP believes to be important to make sure that all segments of our society are eligible for jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have any specific suggestions for the legislation, love to see that in writing. All right. And likewise, uh, uh, for Mr. Wolkanik, uh, you mentioned that some jobs didn't end up all prevailing wage. What do we need to do, put in the legislation to make sure that we do protect our laborers in the state of New Jersey? If you'd send, any, send in your cards and letters, we'd really appreciate hearing what that would be. All right? Any questions from committee members? Yes, sir. Mr. Senator O'Scanlan. Just one quick one for both uh, you gentlemen. Um, you believe these incentives have been successful for Camden. Uh, what do you think about the contention by what seems to be, and maybe you'll, you'll correct me because I might be wrong in this perception, but it seems to be a significant portion of uh, Camden population, folks that are on the ground there, contend that the benefits of these incentives haven't reached the, the working people of Camden, uh, that they benefited solely uh, corporate folks and other folks uh, and the wealthy. Uh, is, that, is there no, no basis in that? Is it just a small, politically motivated, 
group that's making those contentions, or is there some legitimacy? Senator, um, let me try and answer it this way. Um, I drove around in Camden 20 years ago, and the crowds that were the crowds that were not working and were on the streets, and the way the city had looked, in my opinion, was deplorable. Now, I know in this business it's hard to make 100% of the people happy 100% of the time, and I'm sure there are citizens who are not happy with what's going on. But I think if you ever took a ride down there yourself, particularly at night when you see the lights on, the new police force, see all the new buildings, is it where we want to be? Absolutely not. But I've also worked with our unions that are down in the area and have developed programs to bring the inner city people in and teach them pre-apprenticeship so they can help them qualify and take the test and learn a skill. Now, so in my book, it, I don't know how you put a value on this. I don't know if, um, you know, you have to crank into the equation what other states are doing for us to be competitive. There's a few things that I'd like to see changed myself, but to answer your question, um, I think that's the best way to answer it. Is everyone 100% happy all the time? No. Uh, can, can we do other things? Yes. But I, just by virtue of going down there and seeing what's going on, it's really unbelievable. And I know the focus is much on Camden today. And, but I want to share with you, because we have almost a million members in the state, and they're not just all in Camden. They're all around the state of New Jersey. I've seen the benefits in Jersey City. I've seen the benefits as well as you have in Newark, okay? I've seen the way the governor tried to court um, Amazon, wanted to give the wealthiest corporation in the world $7 billion. Am I here to criticize him and say he was wrong? I, I don't know if I could make that judgment. I see what's going on in Atlantic City, which many, many years ago before the casinos was kind of like in the same condition Camden was. Now there's 40 and 50,000 people that are employed there. And I'm proud to say most of those jobs are union. They have a pension, they have health care, they have an opportunity to access education. So is everyone happy? I, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, there's been a tremendous, tremendous business, uh, in, not only in Camden, but I think around the state in terms uh, of, the, of this type of, of project. And I think you would recognize, Senator, that see what New York is doing, you see what Pennsylvania is doing to steal our companies on a daily basis. We have to come out with something. What that is, I think this committee is, is charged with a great opportunity here to draft something. If people aren't happy with what's going on, let's fix it. And let's not just fix it for certain people. Let's fix it for the residents and for workers of this state. Thank you. So, so I pointed out that that conduct's not going to be acceptable. That entire back line cheered, clapped. Officers, remove the entire back line that's standing up. And officer, I'd like you to post some officers over there. If there's any more hollering out, those people should be removed as well. The entire line standing in the back. While they're being removed,
If you would, sir, turn on your microphone, and we'd like to hear from you. Good morning, Chairman Smith and the members of the committee. I want to thank you for your time, for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Clayton Gonzalez, a lifetime Camden resident. I am in trend today to talk about and hopefully to help all understand the transformation I have experienced firsthand in the city of Camden since 2012. Around that time, I began working within the Camden City School District, working with families and engaging the community and coming into frequent contact with many of our wonderful students. Those years, roughly one in five students dropped out of school and fewer than half graduated. And in 2012, just three members of the graduating class were deemed as college ready. I'm sorry to say that when I was growing up in South Camden, or how some may call it downtown, things weren't much better. And those of us who made it through the graduation weren't faced with prospects any better than the students of 2012. There was not one collection of corporations or companies interested in moving in the city. In fact, the ones who were benefiting and eager to move in to our town, as far as I could tell, were funeral directors and bail bondsmen. Families like mine were struggling to stay afloat because we couldn't find work. The struggles pushed a lot of folks to find other ways to make money, and many of the ones I grew up with fell into drug dealing and other illicit pursuits. For most of my life, Camden has been a city where too many families, children, and students were left behind. And at least we felt that way. And those who were looking for honest day's work found little within our city boundaries. Just think, in 2012, the city was the nation's most dangerous. It was a place where every 32 hours, someone was being shot. Some of those being shot, people who I knew. It was a place where I wouldn't let my kids play on a sidewalk, let alone a public park. That was the Camden I grew up in. I'm here today to tell you that the Camden that I grew up in is not the Camden I live in today. I take pride in our city. Over the past five years, the schools I worked in have reached unprecedented milestones that frankly, I never believed possible. Dropout rates are at a record low, graduation rates are at a record high, and test scores up in a meaningful way across the city's public, renaissance, and charter schools. Today, I am proud to send my two children into the school in the city. If you spend time in Camden, the impact of its law and of the companies that it has, that have come into the city and the jobs they've delivered, it's impossible to miss. I see it every day. I go into work. When I put on my uniform, I can see the difference being made for my city, for my family, and myself. On the beat, I see smiling children in the city parks and playing outside of their homes. Their parents talk to me about their new opportunities and the sense of hope that had not been felt for a very long time in our city. If nothing else, that's the thing I want everyone here to take away. My city, where the schools were maligned, the streets were a mess, and where we didn't think we would ever get any, any better, is suddenly teeming with hope that this time things are really changing. I don't have a lot of experience dealing with corporate tax incentives. Honestly, I don't have any at all. But I spent a lifetime in the city of Camden and I can tell you that because of these changes I've seen in the last five years, I can look at my kids and smile because the future that's awaiting them is much brighter than the future that awaited me. I hope our city can live up to their promises I've made them. And I hope everyone here can help us get there. I want to thank the committee again for this time and allowing me this opportunity to speak before you today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I hope I can be of help to any questions. One, okay. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. As this committee and the governor debate what the state of New Jersey should do to support economic development, 
I want to offer my perspective as a small business owner and 17-year advocate for the success of young adults in my beloved community. community. I have voluntarily taken on the critical duty to help neighbors, friends, and community members get a job. I volunteer time writing resumes, walking people through online career assessments, giving interview tips, and connecting Camden residents to employers. Many of Camden's hardworking families spent years, in some cases generations, hoping for a better future, unaware of imperfect but adequate tools. We need to focus on employment with initiatives like Camden County One Stop and the new Camden Works. Last week, as I prepared for this today, I toured the Camden County One Stop, and, which is a part of my county's Workforce Investment Board. It is a hub for job seekers, including a section for young adults to get a skills assessment and take a basic skills test. Before testifying today, I wanted to have confidence in the system, and after seeing the one stop with my own eyes, I can report to you that I do. But we need to do more to make sure that our families have the tools to realize their dreams and people are aware of the services. So as you amend tax credits legislation, you should mandate that a company who locates in a city provides employment to local residents in order to receive incentives. Doing so will formalize the connection between private sector and community while providing predictability to people of all backgrounds in Camden to participate in a regular functioning economy. Up until last year when I was trying to help a young person, to them my good intentions were interpreted as merely words to people that needed cash more than thoughtful advice. Now, with Camden Works, I can refer people to actual caseworkers in Camden who consist our population, our residents, and building a career. Mr. Chairman, for the free market to work at its best, tax incentives and any other tools designed to lift economies must be regulated, regularly reviewed, and reformed when necessary. So therefore, I ask you to develop new legislation that is inclusive and helps the most vulnerable in our communities. The Economic Opportunity Act was an incomplete solution to a problem that no one leader, statute, or policy can fix. I call on this select committee to make things better. My community just wants a decent job, to be on a pathway to a great career. Despite deep systematic issues, Camden does have undeniable and dem dem demonstrable momentum that must be encouraged to impact the most vulnerable residents. If we look back with the lens of blame, instead of looking forward with sights on reform and prosperity, all momentum will falter. In Camden, companies like American Water, the 76ers, Campbell Soup, the Cooper Foundation, Michael's Development, and a few others have been good corporate citizens and neighbors. They donated, participated, communicated with dozens of organizations to create long-term change. With the help of Cooper's Ferry, my friend Rashawn Hornsby, owner of Royal Paper Co., is a signature away from getting what every small business needs, an opportunity to be a vendor. As you know, it takes forms, taxes, fees, and connections to get a big contract. An omission of the Economic Opportunity Act of 2013 was that it did not have a requirement for local businesses or community benefits. So let's codify that in statute. A word of caution, if we subpoena, interrogate, sue, indict, there will be short-term political wins. But that in itself does nothing to help the most vulnerable, the weakest, and the powerless that need a united government the most. In fact, it breeds the opposite, ripping apart the delicate balance that can foster the governor, the legislature, and local political and community leaders to work together to build an economy that works for everyone. So, Mr. Chairman, whatever new legislation comes from knowledge gained in this hearing, I submit that it must address social mobility. The ability for people living in Camden to sustainably increase their personal, family, and generational income in a city with the lowest credit score and per capita in the nation. We must be committed to unity for change. Thank you. Mr. Rohanafard, uh, former superintendent of Camden School Districts and co-founder and CEO of Propel America.
Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, my name is Paymon Rahanafart. As you just heard, I uh, proudly served as the superintendent in Camden from 2013 to 2018. I now um, co-founder and CEO of a nonprofit work workforce development organization that helps recent high school graduates between the ages of 18 and 24 uh, find an upperly mobile first job by empowering them with the skills and credentials and social networks and experiences they need for those jobs. So as Officer Gonzalez mentioned, we saw a great deal of improvement in the city uh, as it relates to education in that five-year span. And it's important to note that when I was first appointed, it came on the heels of a state intervention, which, which led to certainly mixed feelings about the role of a state in, uh, in a city. And to make a really long story short, I think you can say that at the outset, there was a demand for change that extended well beyond that change in governance. And there was a great deal of turnover um, that led to, at times, um, kind of frenetic and chaotic school policies. And I know these two gentlemen to my left uh, experienced that in a very significant way. And so when I came in, I was the 13th superintendent in 16 years, and I would constantly hear teachers tell us about uh, the whiplashing changes and how change was always the constant. And so we aimed to create continuity and bring stability to the district. And by the end of it, certainly no one would tell you the work is done today in Camden. But we saw very significant improvements in the graduation rate, uh, decrease in the dropout rate, test scores at a systems level improved uh, uh, steadily in, in a way you don't typically see at scale. And perhaps what we're most proud of is that we implemented restorative policies inside of schools and we reduced suspension rates and we partnered with the Camden County Police Department to do things the right way and not create a culture of over-discipline. And the last thing I would add is that there was a physical revitalization of our school districts, of our school district facilities. When I came in, half of our buildings were constructed before 1928 with nary a dollar of capital improvements invested. And so we had crumbling facilities and by the end of it, we had invested $336 million across 12 different sites. And 130 million, 136 million of that is for Camden High, the Castle on the Hill, landmark institution in the city. We, did, we went about our work collaboratively and I worked closely with these two gentlemen and many others and held over 100 town halls to ensure that every voice was heard. It's not to say every person agreed with us, but we took a community-focused approach and collaborated with political leaders, community leaders, parents, and students alike. And so I'm so proud to be representing Camden today. I no longer live in the city. Uh, but the work we are doing today and the connection to this, conversation, to this conversation makes me think about a couple of years after I came into the city as superintendent, there was a report that I believe was generated by CamConnect, a local nonprofit, that said 40% of the buildings and lots in the city were vacant at that time. And I don't think anyone would argue that we should not invest in those empty facilities and empty lots. And so for me, tax incentives and investment in a city is a starting point to the conversation. And really the work is about the practice itself. And what I mean by that is, I, with our new organization, we're operating in four states and, and we have a site in South Jersey. And I can tell you the business leaders we work with desperately want to hire young adults, Camden residents into these, I call middle skill jobs. So a certified medical assistant, a pharmacy technician, really well-paying jobs between you know, $18 to $25 an hour. But policy doesn't just solve that problem. Tax incentives don't just solve that problem. They enable the conditions to solve the problem. But the work itself is about creating a, a skilled pipeline of young adults who are trained and have access to training opportunities, have affordable pathways to these jobs. And it's really hard work and important work that won't ultimately be solved by legislation, but again, is enabled by legislation. Uh, and so again, I can testify that these employers very much are working to be part of a rising tide that li that's lifting all boats with a focus on young adults in the city. And thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, we do appreciate the insights on uh, Camden issues. Any questions from members of the committee? Senator O'Scanlan. Uh, I put the same question to, to you gentlemen that I did the previous testifiers. There are folks in Camden on the ground there, community activists, who contend that 
the rosy picture that you're painting is false. That 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 the actual residents, working people, or unemployed people of Camden haven't been benefited from these programs. Sounds like you're in a perfect perspective to, to answer that. And how do you how do you do so? Thank you, but thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Member, Mr. O'Scanlan. Um, I love that question, and, and the answer, um, I think some of it was in my remarks, and I'll, I'll reiterate a few points. One is, across this nation, there's a skills gap. You can graduate from high school with a diploma, doing everything you're supposed to do, and not be eligible for many jobs that don't even require necessarily a, a, a degree. So that's why I mentioned One Stop, where we're in a point where there have been omissions, there have been mistakes. But there also, there's also positive momentum. So we have to bring those things together. A lot of us have done the research. We're making the connections. We have things in place already. So Camden County One Stop is in place. Camden Works supplements that with a website and ways to get people closer on the pathway to, to career. What we need is this legislature to do is look at these things and then make sure that the money and the resources are there so that there's enough money to do things like marketing, to do outreach. I think what may be lost on what Paymon said is that we have a, a lost decade of inadequate level of public education where those were young people who are now young adults or in their early 30s who at no fault of their own uh, were put into a circumstance where um, they might not be able to pass a basic math and reading test to, be, to qualify to be in the AFL-CIO. Um, so these things are being corrected. But we do need legislation, and we need good policy, and we need unity in order to take it to the next to the next level. So I don't. So if a person says, "Hey, you know, I'm 25 and I want to work at such and such place, but they're not hiring anything I'm qualified for," that is a legitimate. That's a legitimate gripe. But the fix to that is is to make sure this young this person has. I always say two parallel paths. The first one is you need to make some money. Make some, you need to make some money right now. And then you also need to be on a pathway to, to get the credentials, whether it's at community college, college, a certificate, um, on a longer path. So we are on that pathway, I believe, right now. Well, a follow-up question to Senator O'Scanlan. Uh, Mr. Brown, can you give us some specific examples where your one-stop pro pro uh, program has worked with individuals to make things happen? So, um, one, I don't want to claim to be an expert on it, but my understanding from talking to both young people, one-stop staff, and some leaders of organizations, uh, Camden and cities like Newark and Jersey City and the state have um, programs sometimes supported by AmeriCorps where you get recruited, you're in the program, and then in that program when you need the next thing, so if you need, when you need the job, they connect you with your local one-stop to get the career assessment, and you sit down with a counselor who does it. And, and again, what we have now is we're adding, the, I shouldn't say we because I don't really have anything to do with it, but the community is, the Camden Works is adding case managers. So you basically will have social workers who are taking people through the steps. I myself signed up for this, I myself signed up for Camden Works when it was first announced. And Friday, coincidentally, or maybe serendipitously when I was preparing for this hearing today, I was actually called by the case manager to see if I needed any specific help in applying and getting jobs. I told her I'm good, but maybe I, I might need to call her next year. I'd like to add uh, to the uh, senator. Yes, sir. So I would say, for example, um, I am a middle child, and I am the only one that actually graduated on time. Um, both my brothers um, do not hold any qualifications that I would say uh, in a regular workforce, in a regular work field, um, can get a good, decent, livable uh, paying job. Um, they today work within the city um, by one of these companies that came into the city and provided them the opportunity to not only just qualify them, give them the certifications. Today, they make a wage. It's, not, it's, it's competable, all right? They are part of a union and they also get benefits. That's just an example of, you know, the companies that are coming in that actually do help. And there's also um, certain programs like HopeWorks um, who actually partnerships with certain uh, other businesses like American Waters and Subaru that provide the opportunity for these kids who are sometimes dropouts to do internships within those companies and actually give them the opportunity to supplement the might what have be the educational background that they might not possess with experience. 
We have some more questions, uh, Senator Lagana and then Senator Adiago. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I just want to piggyback on Senator O'Scanlan's question uh, about the specific needs of the residents not being met. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the unemployment rate, if you're, if you have a knowledge of that? What does it look like now, as opposed to 1980, 1990, 2000? Just where, where are we right now, and uh, uh, and you know where, where are we going uh, on that specific uh, topic? So, so the, the good news is the unemployment rate, the unemployment rate, a trend that started with President Obama, by the way, the unemployment rate in this country has, has gone down since 2009. And um, when you have big issues like Camden has, we are never able to follow the trend exactly as it is. That's, so, so unemployment in Camden is higher than it is in, other, than, than surrounding municip municipalities, but it's also lower than it's been in, in, in the last uh, 30 years, according to data put out by the Department of Labor. Um, there was an article about this just a few, just a few weeks ago. So with, with that said, there's unemployment and there's underemployment. Um, and in the poorest city in America, obviously we have issues with, with these things. There are companies that do hire uh, low-skilled uh, lo, lo, low people. So if you have nothing but a diploma, there are places that are hiring. The thing comes to, though, is are these the, are these the right connection? Because some, these are jobs that are very, um, very hands-on. It's a lot of, it's, 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 it's hard. It's your, you have to have, you know, big muscles. You're pulling stuff at recycling plants and things like that. Uh, which is why we have to have two pathways so that five, ten years from now, people's imagine, what people wanted to do when they were five years old, they can truly live their dream and be happy when they go to work every day. Radiago. Thank you, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> there we go. Um, I guess the officer could answer this one. Um, have you seen, talk about a little bit about the public safety improvements you've seen, because I know as a parent, I would have concerns years ago raising a family in the city of Camden. Can you talk a little bit about the public safety improvements, if any? Uh, well, when it comes to the improvements, of course, um, if you have an open field or an abandoned building, uh, there's obviously uh, a higher chance of you know, criminal activity happening within that building, that empty space. So when you have companies coming in and actually reviving those buildings and making those buildings workable and livable, um, it does help decrease the amount of crime that's happening within that area. And obviously that trickles, that same feeling trickles down you know, to surrounding uh, towns. So again, now that those empty fields are not, no longer there, of course you have less cr criminal activity happening, less chance of a criminal activity even happening. Um, so it does help from an officer's, you know, uh, perspective. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, um, I, I think, you know, based on what I'm listening, uh, I think the three of you could agree that it would have been absolutely disastrous not to have an incentive program. Um, and I think what our goal here is, uh, you know, I know very few programs in the state of New Jersey that are absolutely perfect, but I think our goal here is to see what we can do to make the next program better. So, um, based on what I'm hearing, I just want to see if I'm correct. I'm hearing that when we do the, whatever program we come up with, we really need to look at investments as part of that program. Investments in uh, training uh, high school dropouts or you know, young, young people or young adults. Um, uh, some kind, something has to be put towards that and towards marketing. Is that what I'm getting from all of Yes, um, mar marketing is a critical part because our because the county, I think I think in the state of New Jersey, probably across America, we we put employment services uh, to, at the county level, right? So they once you're there, you're going to get some good services. You're going to get some help getting connected with the job. I think tomorrow they have a census. They have a census fair for people that want to work for the census. The issue is not a lot, of, not necessarily a lot of people know of these services are as good as they are, so they haven't taken advantage of them um, as, as, as they could. If a company is not prepared to have its own intense training program, I believe that they should at least put money into a fund that then pays for those training programs to go, whether it's scholarships for community college or, or whatever. But there has to be money to support the credential a requirement to be able to start a job. And it really just to answer your previous question, there's something that hasn't been discussed yet today that's very, very important to understand urban cities in New Jersey, which is drug addiction. Until we get a grip 
on the fact that people from the suburbs love getting crack cocaine, heroin, or pills in our communities, mm -hmm. taking advantage of disadvantaged uh, neighborhoods. We're not going to be able to get oh, but so far because public safety and drug addiction are, are interconnected issues. So another area then that we should be investing in, and I agree with you, is the um, opioid epidemic. Opioid, wet, uh, crack, mm -hmm. um, you know, it has, it has to be all those, those hard drugs that are, that are being used, but certainly opioids uh, as well. And not just Narcan treatment, but making sure that people have a place to go that's safe and clean, um, and that we as a community are embracing people in our own community and people that live in other communities are being embraced in their communities to get those services as well where they live. Uh, just to confirm, are all three of you residents of the city of Camden? Yes. I am not. Okay. All right, thank you. Senator Bateman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, coming down this morning to testify. And uh, basically, my question is for the superintendent. You know, education is so important, uh, the quality of education. And fortunately, in New Jersey, we have, you know, great schools. How long was your tenure in Camden? How long were you part of the school system? Five years. Five years. And, um, you're retired from Cam superintendent. Are you still in education? I still work in education. I mean, I consider what I do now one foot in education, one foot kind of on the workforce side of the business. Okay. During your tenure in Camden, I, I know that the schools and, and, the, and the grades and the college admissions improved. Did you see a drastic change in those five years? And, and how does that correlate to the money that was spent uh, by the state and by the businesses coming into Camden? How do, how do the improvements in the school district correlate to the rest of the city? Yes. Did you see a drastic improvement when the, when the money was infused into Camden? Did you have, re, did you have programs that you worked with the businesses? Uh, what, I, what I witnessed, and it's worth mentioning, I came from New York City and Newark where, and I recognize this is a very politicized environment, but it was particularly tough politically in Newark and in New York City, big city, complex, et cetera. What I experienced in Camden was an unbelievably collaborative environment. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last part. It's all right. <laughs> what I experienced was an unbelievably collaborative environment where you know, the police chief who recently retired, John Scott Thompson, he and I would speak multiple times a week about how we can work together to not only create, say, safe corridors so students and families feel safe in the morning and arrival and afternoon during dismissal, but um, build stronger relationships between the police and, and schools and promote events where families are outside interacting with police officers. And the same goes with our city council and our mayor where every phone call was always returned and there was just a very functional line of uh, dialogue. And I, I did not experience that in my other two stops in New York City and Newark. And so yeah, I mean, without question, it was a rising tide lifted all boats. Is it perfect? No one's here to tell you it's perfect, but it's fundamentally better. Uh, and so the city feels safer, you see it in the data. Uh, the city looks better, you see it in the data. And, and, and there's a higher quality of education, which is indisputable when you look at state test scores, graduation rates, and dropout rates. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Any other? Uh, Senator, if you would. Um, can you explain to me how this new investment in the city have impacted your neighborhood and your family? Yeah, so I, I live in the Fairview neighborhood of, of Camden, uh, which was designed 101 years ago. Um, the, the impact on my neighborhood is, is it's, it's a great question. It's complex to see because um, I, I live on a block. Uh, there's six people that live on my block and all everybody works that lives that lives on the block. Um, the, young, the youngest people that live the youngest people that live to my left. Um, what I'm able to do is say and it's just really reiterating my comments is say if you or anyone you know needs a job, there is a resource for you. This is how to look it up. These are the people that will help you that are professionals in that process. My neighbors to the right are contractors. Um, because of the level, because properties are so low in the city, there are, there's always work for contractors do in terms of fixing up properties to get them to be rented or sold. Um, and then in terms of crime, it's, I think, it, I think it's, 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 it's hard to say because, uh, my neighborhood is, doesn't really have open air drug. It doesn't have that. It, 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 don't, it, it doesn't, it has one open air drug market. Um, and I don't know if I can connect 
the quality of police work in the last month with more with more boots on the ground necessarily with tax incentives. Sometimes I think when people, I think it's, 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 a, it's a jump because I think it takes so much time for people to find a sustainable job, make adequate income, and then make the, make the decisions in their lives for them and their children where you can actually see a demonstrable level of a lower crime beca because of it. I would say um, we would all agree that a lot of times in inner city urban schools, um, kids tend to fall out of place because of a missing f a family member, either their mom or their dad, or mom, mom's the only provider, but mom has to work three jobs. Um, my brother was that person in his family where he would have to make, work three jobs and he has three daughters, so he was absent most of, his, most of his time. He works in a company, like I said today now, within the city that receives these tax incentives. He works one job, he works from eight to four and gets to spend the rest of his afternoon with his family because he gets paid a well enough wage where he's living, he's paying his bills, he doesn't have to worry about what's to come tomorrow. So it does help. It's, it's, it's helped my family, it's helped, uh, again, the, you know, the people that live in the, in the, uh, the city of Camden, it's my opinion. Any other questions from senators? Thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming in. Our next witness is uh, Mr. George Norcross III, Executive Chairman Connor Strong and Buckaloo, and Chairman of the Board of Trustees. Troop. 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 programs. Can you hear me clearly? Thank you. Let me preface my remarks by thanking NAACP President Richard Smith for leading along with the Latin American Economic Development Association the United Way, and several other organizations. Two weeks ago, it was announced in Camden, led by President Smith and others, that they would be leading the Camden Works Job Training Program, which was a program put in place to provide and to supplement that which is provided by the County of Camden in a way for every resident who desired opportunity, training, and otherwise to become part of society in Camden and enjoy the opportunities that would exist in the city of Camden. 
Susan Story, who I think this committee previously heard from, the president of American Water Company, and I agree to fund the millions of dollars that are necessary to underwrite this program over the next four years. Secondly, I'd like to point out that most of the EDA tax credit awardees in the city of Camden signed a community benefit agreement voluntarily, which was not part of the mandated legislation. Several of the speakers mentioned those are the type of things that should be included in any future legislation. I, of course, support that because the most important thing that can happen in a city like Camden or some of the other challenged cities and communities in our state is opportunities for employment and, more importantly, for training. That will be a common theme you will continue to hear. The community benefit agreement signed by most companies in Camden is helping provide that funding going forward. Senator Smith and other members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to appear here today. I am the executive chairman of Connor Strong and Bucklow and the chairman of the Board of Trustees of Cooper University Healthcare and MD Anderson Cancer Center at Cooper. I am here today to speak for myself, not through lawyers or spokespeople, to defend Camden and to correct many misstatements, mischaracterizations, and outright mistruths that are having a serious negative impact on the revitalization of our city. They need to stop. The residents of Camden and New Jersey deserve better. I believe I have a unique perspective regarding the state's tax incentive programs, which is why they were so important to Camden. Nothing would have occurred in Camden without these tax incentive programs. They did precisely what they were designed by the legislature and the governor. I supported the expansion of the tax incentive program in 2013, as did many, many others. I led organizations which applied for and were approved for incentives, recruited other firms to move to Camden, and 16 months ago, with the benefit of the last five years, called for reforms to the program in the Wall Street Journal. In addition to a copy of my remarks, we have provided each of you with a significant amount of material related to the tax incentive applications of my firm, my partner's firms, and Cooper University Healthcare. We have also provided you with information about the rapid and stunning renaissance Camden is experiencing. I know there's a lot there, but I hope you'll have the opportunity to review these materials. The progress being made is remarkable. I would like to provide some background on why I have dedicated, in part, the last 10 years of my life to help rebuild the city of Camden, and why I will continue that as long as I am here. I was born in Camden in 1956 at Cooper Hospital, the hospital I am proud to chair this day. My grandparents owned a bakery at 3rd and Kane Avenue in Camden. My father served on the Cooper board before me. Our family's tenure exceeds 40 years of service to Cooper University Healthcare that has existed and been the pillar of Camden for over 135 years. I opened my first business at 514 Cooper Street in a basement office with only a card table, a folding chair, and a phone. Today, Connor Strong is among the largest insurance brokerage and employee benefit consulting firms in the country. It does business in all 50 states, and last year generated over $2.5 billion in business. We have 330 employees who have located in our newly opened Camden National Headquarters. I emphasize the word national. When people ask me where your company is located or headquartered, I don't say Philadelphia. I don't say Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I proudly now say Camden, New Jersey. We moved to Camden over 100 professionals 
that were part of our dual national headquarters for over 15 years. Our company was headquartered in part in the city of Philadelphia for over 15 years. We also have 60 other employees in a central and North Jersey offices that have been in existence for many, many years. Our offices expand from Atlanta to Boston. And as I said, we do business all over America. My firm is proudly a corporate resident of the city of Camden, and I personally call Camden my home, where I reside this day. You've heard from others today details about the condition Camden was in just 10 short years ago, but I want to emphasize the dire condition Camden was in just years ago. Camden has lost 33% of its population. It lost 87% of its jobs. The city's per capita income of $13,000 made Camden the poorest city in America. Half of all residents 25 or older had less than a high school diploma, more than double the rate statewide. Amazingly, 26 of the 20, excuse me, 23 of the 26 lowest performing schools in the entire state of New Jersey were located in Camden. Public employee and teachers unions were concerned about the well-being and safety of their members who were working in the city. 70% of Camden's budget and a majority of its school funding came as funding from the state of New Jersey. There were several unsuccessful attempted rescues of Camden, the construction of an aquarium and a baseball stadium are among the most well-known. But in 2012, Camden, a city with one of the richest histories of innovation, the home of the RCA Corporation and manufacturing in our country was essentially a ward of the state. Beginning in the latter part of the Corzine administration under Governor John Corzine and Attorney General Ann Milgram, along with leaders at Cooper, other business leaders, community leaders, and religious leaders, it was time for Camden to take action. It was time to effect change. The first step was to make the city safer. No one was going to invest in a city where you could buy sex, drugs, or get murdered in the same block. No one. The second step was to improve its schools. And in conjunction with a partnership of the New Jersey Education Association, we advocated for the passage of the Urban Hope Act. That act allowed for Camden and two other municipalities in the state to reorganize their public school system and provide opportunities and choice and innovation for the students of Camden. The former superintendent who just spoke to you was a leader of that effort. And I'm proud to say today that parents in Camden have choice, whereas seven years ago, they had little choice and little opportunity. We now have competing public school districts, whether they be Renaissance schools, charter schools, traditional public schools, or the religious schools in the city. Amazingly, each of those school districts, if you will, are now competing for students to attend their school because parents now have a choice. The program we put in place with the partnership with the Teachers Association has worked in Camden. We have longer school days, longer school years, innovative programs. Next year, Camden High, newly constructed, which was authorized under the Christie administration, will open and be restored to its former greatness. The record is clear that our collective actions over the past several years are working. We have a long way to go. The job is nowhere near being finished. Amazingly, 
Camden is the safest. It has been in 50 years. 50 years. New state-of-the-art schools are being opened. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on new schools. Several of the public schools, which the former superintendent alluded to, that were built prior to 1928, did not have proper bathroom facilities in working order for the children in the city of Camden, a disgraceful condition. Importantly, now more residents have jobs than just five years ago. The Department of Labor recently reported Camden's unemployment was at a 30-year low. Unemployment, excuse me. More than 1,200 residents who weren't working two years ago are today. And there are literally thousands of job openings on a public website listing the companies that have moved to Camden for anyone to look at at any time. And earlier this month, as I previously mentioned, the city announced the Camden Works program. And I mentioned those that were sponsoring the program. The importance of this program is to have those who can best train the residents of the city and be engaged with them and be comforting to those from the city because each of these organizations has its origin in the city of Camden. Additionally and very proudly, thousands of men and women in the building trades have constructed over $3 billion worth of new or substantially renovated construction in the city of Camden, putting people back to work again, something we are all very proud of. Across the country, this progress has been applauded. As President Obama said when he visited the city, he said Camden should be held up, quote, as a symbol of promise for our entire nation, for what they have achieved and will continue with hard work and focus. President Obama chose to come to the city of Camden to visit and to see what community policing had been put in place that had produced such amazing results and the manner in which the school system, public school system, I might add, had been reorganized. We've heard from many critics that residents of the Camden have not benefited in any way, shape, or form from the changes going on in Camden. This is clearly not correct. When schools are materially better, when public safety is improving at a rapid pace, certainly every resident of the city is being touched. Much, much more work to do. So where do the tax incentives that have received so much unwarranted negative attention in recent months fit into the story of rebuilding Camden and other struggling New Jersey cities? The answer is simple. Rebuilding Camden's economic base was always the third step in the overall plan. First, public safety, second, improved education, and then economic development. While the first two were largely functions of government and nonprofits, it was always clear that to bring jobs back to Camden, companies would need specific incentives to entice them to tie their future to what has been named as America's most dangerous and poorest city. Prior to these programs being put in place, no, cam no company of any material nature had moved and located to the city of Camden. There had been nothing but an exodus for years and decades from the city. That was what the 2013 Economic Opportunity Act has done. It has provided companies that wanted to be in Camden, were willing to take that risk, and had the ability to do so. That legislation was the product of the work of dozens of people, dozens and dozens over seven months, including legislative and administrative staff like Eugene Lapour, Colin Newman, Tim Lazara, Kevin Donahue, Catherine Brennan, outside experts like Ted Lazara, 
Paul St. Ange, Bill Caruso, Bill Kastner, John Sheridan, Kevin Sheehan, and Jay Biggins. And of course, Senators Lesniak and Carrillos were the ultimate authors of the act. But let me give you some context and background, if I may, as to the details of the program, which have been difficult for many to understand. The Grow New Jersey program, which was reauthorized, the State Incentive Award Program, originally enacted in 2012. In order to be eligible for Grow New Jersey tax credits, a business relocated or expanding had to make a qualifying capital investment. This is up front. Most people who read about the incentive program are under the false impression that the state of New Jersey writes a check from the general treasury for the amount of your award and hands it to you on day one. That is completely false. The company relocating and receiving a grant award in general puts up 100% of the money until perhaps year four, where they first qualify if they met the requirements of the EDA in job retention and creation to receive their first 10% award in a tax credit. Which, by way of an example, if you were investing $200 million in any city in New Jersey, you put that $200 million up. The state of New Jersey has no obligation whatsoever to assist, fund, or guarantee that investment or its debt. The obligation written under the statute is the applicant, the company moving to the city of Camden. The second, retain or create a minimum number of jobs for over 15 years. 15 years is the requirement. If you receive your tax credits over 10 years, the legislature and perhaps the authors and their wisdom required these companies to guarantee for five more years a clawback provision that if after your 10 years you decided, I don't need these employees anymore or require retention, the state has the ability to claw back any or all part of your tax credit award. Now, for those of you that have borrowed money from banks, there are a lot of covenants in loan documents. This is far more aggressive and stringent in protection of the taxpayers than any banking institution would ever require. One of the most important aspects of these rules is the requirement of the upfront capital investment. It requires making a long-term commitment in the way of capital, building buildings, renovating buildings. And as we all know, you can't pick up a building and move it. Once you're there, particularly in the city of Camden, you are committed to the renaissance of that city and success. Let me give you an example of why that's important. Consider Philadelphia. Camden is in Philadelphia's shadow. That city has a 10-year property tax abatement program for new construction and investment. It's done wonders to spur new development in Philadelphia, except after the abatement expires in 10 years, the owners, the tenants, and others are free to move on with no clawback provisions, no nothing. The state of New Jersey correctly wrote a statute that had people bound to the investment that taxpayers made in their city. Under the Grow New Jersey program, for each of the 10 years after the firm makes a qualified investment, usually three to four years after the initial capital investment, the CEO must certify under oath that the firm has met its job creation and retention obligations. And the state annually reviews that requirement. If the firm does meet the obligation, it receives a 10% tax credit and so on and so forth in the following years. But a point that's important to be made here, when the state issues $100 million of tax credit to Prudential or J.P. Morgan Chase or any large company that's received them in our state, after they pay 
federal income taxes on the grant. Yes, it's taxable. And after you pay the other cost and fees associated with the tax credits, you're left with less than 50 cents on a dollar as a subsidy. Now, perhaps that should be given some consideration because the public, as I said, believes that the state treasury wrote a check to a company for the full amount of the award without detailing the requirements of the tax credit legislation and annual certification requirements. In 2013, the Grow New Jersey program was amended to, among other things, create the Garden State Growth Zone, which provided specific incentives for five of the poorest cities in New Jersey, Camden, Passaic, Trenton, Atlantic City, and Patterson. Companies seeking centers under this program to move to Camden and Atlantic City did not have to certify their jobs were at risk of leaving the state, but rather that the award of incentives was a material factor in their decision to locate to Camden or Atlantic City. Unfortunately, there are those who either have misread the statute and regulations, don't comprehend the statutes or regulations, or it doesn't meet the narrative they're wishing to speak about. I have a copy, and you've been provided with the 2013 statute and regulations that state what I just mentioned. Because later in my remarks, you're going to understand the difference between the 2013 statute and regulations for Camden and Atlantic City and the new regulations in 2017. But if you try to apply the 2017 regulations to prior applications, meaning those made in 2013, 14, 15, you're going to see the confusion that exists as a result of the changes that were made, which I will allude to in a moment. When the regulations were changed in 2017, it required the company to demonstrate that they could leave the state of New Jersey. They had the means. Jobs were at risk if the state or the EDA in its wisdom did not see fit to grant the application and the award. That's an important difference because back in 2012 and 13 and 14, Camden was not Brooklyn. It was not Jersey City where when you build a building for 200 million, the day you open the building, it's worth three or 400 million. When you built a building in Camden like American Water, Subaru and other companies did, early on, that building was worth less than the construction cost. Why? Because it was Camden, New Jersey. It was a city that had lost its way, America's most dangerous and poor city, and no one had any level of confidence in that investment that was being made there. The creation of the Garden State Growth Zone Program was important to refocus on the state incentive programs away from helping some of the richest companies in our country. Let me read you a list of some of the companies that received incentives, in some cases, hundreds of millions. J.P. Morgan, Merrill Lynch, Pfizer, Goldman Sachs, New York Life, UPS, Siemens, Forbes, Panasonic, Verizon, Ernst & Young, Barclays, Quest Diagnostics, Ralph Lauren, and Gucci all received tax incentives. Now, let me address two of those incentive programs. Prudential was awarded a significant award in our state. Does anyone sitting here actually think that Prudential was ever leaving the state of New Jersey? And why wasn't that application scrutinized publicly as a result of the discussions going on involving companies in Camden, New Jersey, America's most dangerous city? 
And let me ta now turn to a recently authorized incentive program. Teva Pharmaceutical Company. They received, I believe, $40 million. When they were awarded by the EDA that $40 million, a simple Google search would have determined that they were involved in bribing foreign governments in order to manufacture and distribute opioids outside the United States. There are some that believe that the Foreign Corruption Act might apply here in America to a company that settled by paying hundreds of millions of dollars for allegedly bribing foreign governments. But let's make matters worse if you're already not offended. Counties in New Jersey were already suing Teva for manufacturing and distributing opioids in the state of New Jersey, addicting our children and our families. And then the Attorney General of our state later sues Teva, but yet they were awarded $40 million. Now, a simple Google search and any ample research by the administration of the state or the EDA would have discovered this. I'm leading up to a point at the conclusion of my remarks that I hope you'll learn to appreciate going forward. To this day, the New Jersey GROW program does not require jobs for a project in Camden to be at risk of leaving the state in order to receive tax credits. And until they were changed in 2017, the regulations also did not require jobs in Camden and Atlantic City to be at risk of leaving the state to be counted in the net benefit test used to determine the incentive. My firm, Connor Strong, Cooper University Healthcare, and many other firms applied for and are approved for incentives under the Garden State Growth Zone Program to relocate to Camden. As you know, my interest in Camden is longstanding, but my involvement as a leader in the Renaissance is directly related to my role as chair of Cooper University Healthcare and the MD Anderson Cancer Center at Cooper. So I'd like to address some of the mischaracterizations about its application to relocate more than 350 workers into the city. A copy of that application has been provided to you. I might add back in 2013 and 14, the Cooper employees that moved to the city of Camden represented the largest influx of employees to the city of Camden in decades. Decades. Nobody was moving to Camden. And Cooper was the first, as a 135-year corporate citizen, moving to the city of Camden. First, so there's no confusion, Cooper University Healthcare is a not-for-profit institution. No one owns any portion of the health system, nor does anyone receive any profit or dividends from its operations. I volunteer my services for over 30 years as chairman and member of the Board of Trustees. Some have raised questions about why a nonprofit received a tax incentive, and it was, of course, to incentivize a move to Camden. But other nonprofits also received awards, including Rutgers University where Professor Chen, the chairman of the task force, is on the faculty. They received tax credits out of a housing program, a housing program to construct an athletic complex. One may wonder how an athletic complex qualifies as a housing complex. I don't recall any mention of examination of this tax credit that was awarded. Not one. I have been a big advocate of many, many years, and members of this committee are aware, in the reorganization of Rutgers University, which successfully completed several years ago, has elevated Rutgers in New Brunswick, Newark, and Camden. But when the chairman of the task force who works for Rutgers University fails to examine his university's own tax credit, I think it's fair to call that award, pretending to be a housing award, 
into question. But for Cooper's project, the following facts are not in dispute. November 7, 2014, Cooper filed and certified an application for tax incentives to move 353 employees to the city of Camden. We wanted to consolidate our business operations closer to the hospital, as well as expand Camden's commitment, our commitment to the city of Camden. The application was prepared by Cooper's staff and Adrian Kirby, our chief executive officer at the time, signed by the CEO in its certification. The application specifically stated that no jobs were at risk of leaving the state of New Jersey. No jobs would ever leave the state of New Jersey. Not one. The board which I chair authorized the filing of the application. To date, Cooper has not only moved 353 employees to the city of Camden. I'm proud to say that we are in excess of 550 today and have invested over $17 million in that complex. Far more, far more than we ever represented to the EDA. At the request of the EDA, Cooper submitted a cost-benefit analysis which compared a potential Camden location to its existing New Jersey leases. On November 13, 2014, the EDA contacted Cooper by telephone. The next day, a Cooper employee sent an email to his supervisor stating the EDA had asked for an out-of-state comp to support its application. Only after the contact did Cooper begin to review out-of-state property in order to comply with the EDA's request to submit a second cost-benefit analysis comparing an out-of-state location to Camden. That was not required under this statute and regulations. Cooper has been clear from the start. Its jobs were never at risk of leaving the state, which was confirmed by emails between Cooper and the EDA a few days before the EDA's approval of its application. In those emails, Cooper explained its representatives had not even visited the out-of-state locations. Cooper was merely providing comp data as requested by the EDA and documented accordingly. In December of 2014, the EDA unanimously approved the Cooper Award. More than two years later, in January of 2017, regulators and regulations that were issued requiring all jobs in New Jersey growth zones to be certified at risk of leaving the state in order to include those jobs in the next net benefit test. This is the point I made earlier. There was one set of rules in 2013 that were changed in 2017. That has been missed by virtually everyone who's written on this subject. The task force which incorrectly, inaccurately misstated this set of facts which are well documented. Cooper, in the words of the task force, was being asked to be compared to regulations in 2017 to their 2013 application. The rules of the game changed. And by the way, they changed for Connor Strong, the Michaels organization, NFI, and virtually every company that located during that time period or sought awards from the EDA. And all of those companies comply with the new rules. My commitment to Camden is far broader than just my role at Cooper. With my partners at NFI and the Michaels organization, we have invested upfront capital of more than $300 million in Camden's future. We invested in an office building that was left partially vacant in order to provide opportunity for other companies. Together, our three companies pledged $1 million for a not-for-profit foundation to be administered by the Cooper Foundation in order for not-for-profits in the city of Camden to have opportunities for grants 
to advance the interest of their programs. This is not required by a community benefit agreement. AmeriHealth Insurance Company, the Cooper Foundation, and the Norcross Foundation. with paid staff similar to the one that I enjoyed growing up, that all of you probably participated in as young kids, where boys and girls had the opportunity to play sports in a volunteer nature. Camden had no such organization citywide. It was funded with a million dollars. We continue to operate that today, and I am extraordinarily proud and how successful that has become. It is integrated into, on a daily basis, the staff and players from the Philadelphia 76ers who volunteer their time, Camden's great athletes that have served in the professional leagues of the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, and others, and great prominent residents of South Jersey like Ron Jaworski and Mike Quick from the Philadelphia Eagles have spearheaded this organization. And probably most importantly, Cooper University Healthcare provides health screening tests for free for every child who enrolls in this program. Mom and dad are not required to pay for a health screening. Cooper does it as part of its community mission. And in 2016, more than three years after we applied to move, our national headquarters, which is known as Triad 1828 Center, has brought more than 1,000 new employees to the city of Camden. Connor Strong still has two other offices, which it's had for 25 years in Central and North Jersey. There were some who early on said, Connor Strong would never leave New Jersey, thinking we only had one office. Of course we'd never leave New Jersey. This is where we work, we live, we pay our taxes. And we always had two other major offices in Central and North Jersey. The reason we were forced, Connor Strong, to make a decision is because our leases in Cherry Hill, Marlton, New Jersey, and Center City, Philadelphia, which formed the basis for our dual national headquarters, were coming to expiration. We then had to make a decision. We were continually facing increasing difficult times to recruit high-level talent, particularly young talent, in a suburban office park. For that reason, we knew we needed to be closer to a major city. While many in my firm wanted to consolidate in Philadelphia, most especially the 100 people that had worked there for 15 years, one of our dual national headquarters our partners decided that we would consider becoming part of the Camden Renaissance program. Part of that decision became when our former president at Cooper, John Sheridan, came to me and said, you're out there recruiting, begging, selling the city of Camden. If you moved your company to Camden and considered doing that, that would make a very big statement. That had a profound impact. Obviously, no one was moving to the city of Camden, including us, without the award of tax credits. So we decided to consider that if awarded those tax credits and that material decision to receive the tax credits were the reason that we would consider coming to Camden. But the decision ultimately was Philadelphia or Camden. And for those of you who are familiar with Philadelphia, there is ample large office space availability. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has very aggressive tax incentive programs, abatements of corporate income taxes, individual, real estate taxes, and others. Any one of our companies could easily have located at the Philadelphia Naval Yard, which Liberty Property Trust was the master developer. 
and some very significant companies had relocated there. There were many acres available for construction with extraordinarily generous tax incentives. I can see the Naval Yard from Camden. I can see Center City, Philadelphia, any one of our companies, American Water, Subaru, any one of the companies, EMR, could have gone right over that bridge, paid 3% corporate and individual income tax, abated real estate taxes, and other incentives that the Commonwealth were providing people with. My partners and I made a decision, subject to the tax credits, to take the risk, be part of where our families had begun their businesses. In the case of NFI, third generation family, operating one of the largest logistics and trucking companies in the country. All of this becomes extraordinarily important when determining the net benefit required to be approved. I'll use my words. Connor Strong, NFI, Michael's organization, American Water, Subaru, had to have the means, the ability, to move out of the state of New Jersey, hence the term at risk. As you can tell, any and all of these companies could have moved to eastern Pennsylvania and would have been embraced and welcomed by the Commonwealth with ease. Every one of them chose to stay. Now, there were many companies that we solicited and asked that turned us down. One of the changes that occurred in the Connor Strong application, which was probably an oversight in the legislation that was drafted, was an important and significant matter. The Archer Griner Law Firm, who originated in Camden many years ago, had grown to be South Jersey's largest law firm and among the largest in the state, had contemplated moving from Haddonfield to Camden with 250 lawyers and staff. It was discovered that because their lawyers are licensed, the at-risk provision applied. Therefore, they couldn't leave the state of New Jersey because they're practicing law. Now, unfortunately, that was a flaw in the legislation because not for that, Archer would have been awarded tax credits, moved a major law firm to Camden. Imagine for the moment if Gateway and Newark didn't have professionals that had licenses, legal, engineering, professional. If one is to consider the enactment of new legislation, that's something that should be considered. One would want to incentivize companies like that to move to urban areas that matter. Likewise, Connor Strong had so many employees, 69 I believe is the number, that had licenses in the Department of Community Affairs for safety inspections, engineering, and otherwise. They were deemed ineligible to be counted in the application for Connor Strong. To be clear, and no matter which way one looks at the criteria for Connor Strong and Bucklow, and the questionable reading that the task force applied, Connor Strong's incentive would not have changed one penny. Why? Because we moved so many people from Philadelphia to Camden. And for that, as an avid tennis player, I say, game, set, match. We met and exceeded by far the criteria. After five months of extensive due diligence providing additional info in response to the question and request by the EDA staff and review by the Attorney General's Office of New Jersey, it was approved unanimously by the DDA board. As you know, the task force's review isn't the first time our application has been reviewed. In 2017 and 18, the United States Attorney's Office in New Jersey reviewed the entire Connor Strong tax credit application and file. Our team met with them for hours. We provided them with thousands of pages of documents. And after review of the applicable law and, most important, the facts, 
the U.S. Attorney's Office concluded that no further action was warranted and the matter was closed. There isn't enough time for me to go through all the errors and misstatements that have been made related to the Camden tax awards. I do, however, want to speak to several. Not just sloppy error, errors like the claim that Cooper's staff was moving into a gleaming office tower along the Camden waterfront when they're actually in a three-story brick building blocks away. Any discussion about false claims being made against projects in Camden has to begin with the work of the task force, which has made a series of selective, misleading, and often outright incorrect statements. One can only wonder why, out of approximately 913 incentive awards during the past several gubernatorial administrations, why has Camden been the focus? Why have only five to seven companies, all located in Camden, been the principal focus and received the largest amount of media attention? That must struck some people as odd. Compliance, regulation, review is a proper role of government, and I strenuously support all of it. The task force never provided us, NFI, Michaels, Connor Strong, Cooper, an opportunity, as you would receive from the New Jersey Attorney General's Office, or the Controller's Office, or even the United States Attorney's Office, to come in and discuss, defend, and review its applications. One of our notices from them came at a late hour and said, and these are my words, you have copies of their letters. Tomorrow we're going to be holding a public event. Your company may or may not be subject to claims, assertions, accusations, et cetera, et cetera. And if you care to comment, we'll be happy to accept a written document from you after you're smeared publicly and the very kind invitation to limit our comments publicly at a future hearing for five minutes. Five minutes we were afforded. This is all documented. The task force had its mission to review the Camden applications. And that is precisely what it has largely done. Now, you may hear from them that they spoke about a few other companies but not many, and hardly any got the kind of publicity that these applications got. If there's any place in the state of New Jersey, maybe even our country, that tax incentives have worked, it was to take America's most dangerous and poor city and begin a process of turning it around that President Obama came and applauded, came and applauded in our city. On Friday, we received from the media, not the task force, a letter from Mr. Walden, who's the counsel to the task force. A letter that had questions he thought you folks should ask. Let me be clear. He has never, to this day, asked me these questions. We learned about him from the media. He did not invite me to testify three times but rather once, as I said, for five minutes. I'm submitting those letters to you for your review, and you can make your own conclusion. Throughout the process, he has exhibited a fundamental misunderstanding of the law, its requirements, and our applications. He is referring to 2017 statutes and regulations as they apply to applicants in 2013 and 14. This body and the EDA changed the rules. They changed the rules. But he conveniently ignores it going forward. These have all been pointed out to him in letters that have been sent to the EDA and to the task force. The most critical error the task force has made is that my firm and my partners had committed to move to Camden years before we filed our application, much less when they were approved. 
This is not true. The claim is based on an incorrect reading of a single newspaper article and a press release issued by the city of Camden, neither of which say that we are committed to moving our firms. In fact, both state explicitly that we would consider relocating our national headquarters to Camden if the tax credits were approved. More to the point, there's ample evidence that each firm seriously considered moving out of state and took affirmative steps to find additional space. We didn't do this because we were required to, but because we seriously considered locating our national headquarters in Pennsylvania, where half my staff already was located. It's a fact that our proposed development was not certain to happen, and in fact, on a number of occasions, almost never happened. In recent days, we have found that in late October 2016, my partners and I determined that we were unable to come to terms with the developer of the Camden Waterfront and declared our project dead, declared it done. We were only coming to Camden if we were able to achieve the tax credit award and suitable arrangements to build a $255 million building. It is no secret that during this period, Liberty Property Trust and our partners had disagreements over the construction of our project and its costs. The cost of construction in Camden is no different than the cost of construction in the city of Philadelphia, extraordinarily expensive. We couldn't reach an agreement and our deal almost collapsed. I'm submitting today copies of the emails among the three partners in Liberty Property Trust, which declared, I declared the deal dead. It was not happening. The task force falsely claimed that we had made a decision three years before to move to Camden. We didn't commit to move there because we couldn't commit until we had a building. Fundamental misunderstandings like this that have led to some seriously flawed reporting. Reporting like the outrageous claim that a proposed supermarket failed to qualify for tax credits under a 2013 amendment of the EOA. Somehow the story failed to note that the same supermarket that was claimed to have been deprived to move to Camden had been just a year before awarded tax incentives under the urban program. Let me repeat that. The company was already awarded tax incentives a year before. So it does beg the question of how a $50 million award made a year before and changes to legislation would have prevented that company from building. In fact, when they received the award, they were required to immediately begin building their supermarket. Not only didn't they begin building, they didn't move a shovel of dirt. It never happened because they had no tenant. They were unable to move forward for that full year. And therefore, this change somehow blocked someone else, complete falsehood phony assertion. Someone didn't do their homework when they reported the story that the tax credits were previously granted to that alleged harm real estate company. Another false claim is that $1.6 billion of the incentives awarded to Camden-based firms went to entities that I am somehow affiliated with. One of the firms, a tenant in the building, that I'm a passive investor in. I've never met the owners. I have no idea who they are. Another firm, my brother's law firm, did some work for, work unrelated to the tax incentives. This firm, by the way, is Subaru, a firm I don't own any stock in, which invested $120 million in their new headquarters in Camden. I believe the CEO testified here last month and spoke about locating in Indiana, not just Eastern Pennsylvania. 
They were moving their national headquarters, but not for these. Others are firms or organizations which I have no interest and from which I have no compensation, none whatsoever. But while the $1.1 billion is false, let me be clear. I did everything I could to entice firms to come to Camden. I asked friends, I asked business partners, I asked strangers. I made personal visits to companies. Some said yes, most said no. And prior to the passage of the 2013 program, all said no. Those who said yes believe in a better Camden. They took great risks, personal and business, to help support the city. They do not deserve to be smeared and attacked by uninformed critics and dark money funded groups. Like others, because we are committed to Camden, my firm and our partners, NFI and the Michaels organization, decided to move to Camden. Each could have moved anywhere, including the Philadelphia Navy Yard, as I mentioned, or the Philadelphia suburbs. But we decided to invest in Camden. Despite all the false allegations that we have been made against us, it was the right decision and we are proud of it. In closing, let me thank you for the opportunity to provide additional information about why New Jersey Growth Zone Program has been such a success and imperative in Camden, and to clear up some of the many misstatements, mischaracterizations, and mistruths that have been made. I am happy to answer any and all questions. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Norcross, uh, on, the, on the prime uh, direction of the committee, should the state of New Jersey reauthorize these programs, what should we do differently? Well, there were several things I alluded to. Community benefit agreements are a must for any awardee. That should require them to provide financial support to the community that they are locating to or maintaining um, their corporate residence in. Number two, a job training program in some of our most challenged cities is imperative. A program like that needs to be funded. And the only place money like that is coming from is from these companies that I have asked and received virtually unanimous support from. And we're kind enough with the NAACP and others to lead that program. We're financing the program. We're not running the program. We're not qualified to run the program. We're there to support the millions of dollars necessary. Lastly, and some of the prior speakers probably would not agree with me on this, I think an incentive program in the state of New Jersey ought to be exclusively focused on the most challenged municipalities in our state. If you want people to come to this city, Trenton, New Jersey, you are going to need to incentivize them, or Camden, or parts of Newark. I don't think incentives are needed in Jersey City because that's a prop profit platform. That's where the major corporations have located, built buildings, made hundreds of millions of dollars in profits. Jersey City entered a, re a resurrection a number of years ago, particularly with its proximity to Manhattan. Undoubtedly, there are incidents where a governor may need to advocate for or consider. Example, the case of Amazon, considering to come to the state of New Jersey. I supported that. Governor Murphy supported it. Many did. Appreciate your comments. Senator Lagana. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Norcross. Thank you for your testimony. There have been um, suggestions, allegations um, that you were personally involved in the drafting of the uh, Economic Opportunity Act, and that in doing so, we were left with a product that would specifically benefit yourself, Connor Strong, um, Cooper, and those who would be connected to you, of course. Can you please respond to those allegations? Oh, somebody, I'm sorry. I was a huge advocate of an incentive program for Camden, 
Newark, Trenton, Patterson, Atlantic City, because I felt that was what was needed to induce a company to take the risk to move to any or all of these cities. And I think you'll find that companies that have moved to any or all of the cities I mentioned have received some form of inducement. This act was written in 2013. Our company, Connor Strong, NFI, Michaels, uh, American Water, I believe a year before, Subaru approximately that time, some three to four years later, contemplated moving to Camden. A suggestion that legislation was merely written for four or five companies is absurd. There were scores of people involved all over the state who had interests in wanting to see incentive programs benefit their community, rightfully so. There were those who represented companies that wanted to see provisions included in there. The act was not designed for any one municipality. It was designed to incentivize, induce, encourage, embrace, and love companies that were prepared to take a risk to move to some of our most challenged municipalities in our state. In our case, it was all about Camden. And as I said at the beginning of my remarks, former Attorney General Ann Milgram, Governor Corzine, first took the initiative and first assembled the leadership in Camden, the religious community, uh, the community leaders, the governmental leaders, um, and, and, and grassroots activists of what was going to become of Camden. And that was continued during the Christie administration extraordinarily aggressively. We were all proud of the act that was written. It was written in the case that a decision would be made by each and every company in a material manner as to the award of the tax incentive program, and most importantly, the strict compliance with the act by the companies like my own. Senator Adiago. Senator Would you consider your involvement more of, of an advocate, uh, an influencer, someone who was you know, just uh, had the, the knowledge and experience of the city. Uh, how would you describe your input into the actual drafting? Well, I wasn't involved in the actual drafting of the statute, but I was a advocate, as I said, and I pointed out in the beginning, my advocacy comes from as chair of Cooper University Healthcare. We're the largest employer in the county, the largest employer in the city, and we employ more Camden residents than any company in the city. Cooper had existed in Camden for 135 years. If the city were to fail or to continue failing as it had for the last 50 years, the decisions made by prior trustees of the institution, including my father in the 1980s, who resisted Cooper moving to the suburbs when other healthcare organizations were abandoning the city. And in the late 90s, the decision that our board made and I advocated for strongly never to leave the city of Camden. We are a pillar of this city. My adv advocacy comes from that role, that interaction, and the manner in which Cooper is the largest institution in the city. Senator Adiago. Thank you, Chairman, and, and thank you uh, for testifying, Mr. Norcross. Um, along the lines of allegations that happen to be out there right now. And I think you touched on this a little bit, but I would like you to be a little clearer. Um, can you address the notion advanced by some that you profited directly from the Economic Opportunity Act of 2013? Sure. <laughs> My partners and I have put out over $300 million as I sit here today. We built the first market rate apartment housing in the city of Camden in 20 years, in a building that I actually reside in, my brother Donald resides in, and many others that I've tried to recruit to live in that building. We also have spent $255 million in our office building where three companies' national headquarters are located, and we purchased the ferry terminal building, which was built some 20 years ago in Camden. We have paid 
millions and millions of dollars already to the city of Camden and to the EDA in fees as part of this program. So I think many would characterize this as we're way underwater at the moment. We're all in for the city of Camden and Camden rising. Senator O'Scanlan. Mine's on here. First, Mr. Inf pretty comprehensive uh, that that the process of drafting this legislation was hijacked somehow, purportedly by you, it's, with, with inference and, and directly that's been stated. And then once the program was passed, uh, it was exploited so that you and companies you control uh, could get benefits for which they were not entitled. Um, you say you stated and I'll give you another opportunity uh, to, to pull no punches and unequivocally state that you consider all that to be bogus. Thank you. First of all, there's no dispute in the facts that many, many, many scores of people were involved in drafting and engaged in the intent of the legislation. There's no dispute. Democrats, Republicans, real estate interests that have nothing to do with Camden, that had something to do with Jersey City or Newark or Trenton. There were many, many parties involved. The focus of attention became that my brother, my youngest brother's law firm, and by the way, I failed to uh, inform you, my brother Philip is the chairman of the Cooper Foundation. All of his work done with regard to this um, in Camden is done on a volunteer basis, just as mine is as chair of Cooper University Healthcare. But there have been dozens and dozens of people. I named some of the names, many of who are very familiar to all of you up here. It was comprehensive, complicated legislation. How do you make Camden, Trenton, Newark, and other challenged cities better? How do you induce big companies to pick up like Subaru, American Water, the largest water utility in the country, to move to Camden from suburban Camden County. How do you do that? And the only way you do it is to incentivize companies that if they'll come to Camden and be part of a comprehensive plan, some companies who have a corporate attitude of engagement and involvement with their brethren, like the Campbell Soup Company, who's been in Camden for 150 years and our leading corporate entity, who for decades have been engaged in this. The reality of all of this is there has been material change in Camden for the better. The job is far from being finished, far. Cooper Foundation sent a letter in English and in Spanish to 35,000 households in Camden offering anyone interested in a building trades apprenticeship, learn how to be a carpenter, an electrician, a plumber, whatever. I negotiated, along with my brother Donald at the time, an agreement with the Building Trades Council of Camden County and vicinity that they would help train Camden residents to move into building trades jobs. We have walked and talked and engaged virtually every constituency group in the city. Now, as one previous speaker pointed out, there are always going to be those that are opposed. Some are against everything and for nothing except mom, apple pie, and the American flag. They will counter and criticize anything and everything. The facts in Camden speak for themselves. Unemployment rate, crime rate at 50-year low, schools, graduation rates, things are getting better, competition. There will always be those that may think a different way is better. But if I was representing the taxpayers of the state of New Jersey and every year get appropriated to places like Newark and Camden and I'm sure Trenton, 
hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in state aid. I'd be interested in how I can lessen the reliance on state taxpayer money for a place like Camden. How do you do it? You create tax-paying rateables, companies that will help grow businesses. In the downtown Camden area, there are over 14,000 employees between Rutgers University, um, Subaru, American Water, Connor Strong, NFI, Michaels, Philadelphia 76ers. I can go down a litany. Students. There are very few suitable restaurants that exist today. People have to leave the city to dine. My partners and I invested $8 million in attracting a renowned chef from Philadelphia to come and put in place two spectacular restaurants for the community. And now what you're seeing is community, small businesses are starting to build restaurants, suppliers of goods and services for the masses of people that are there today that have no um, ability to receive those services. Camden's not Cherry Hill. So what's happening is all these things, the expansion of Rutgers University, as I mentioned, under the Rutgers Reorganization Act, the School of Nursing in Camden, which now has over 1,000 nursing students. People need a place to eat. People need a place to live. The Cooper Medical School, which has 400 medical students at a given time, we want them to live in Camden, not live in the suburbs. So all of this is work in progress. We regularly meet with the leaders of the religious and community uh, individuals in this city. People like Richard Smith, people like the leaders of LIETA, of the United Way, of HopeWorks, of every social service organization. What can we be doing better? How we, can we provide? The current initiative that we're working on now is a homeless facility. Drive through any city in New Jersey that's challenged. You're going to see people sleeping on the sidewalk. We have a responsibility to care for those individuals and provide them shelter, not just move them off of where they're sleeping. That's unacceptable. And that is another initiative. We are moving forward on a demolition initiative. There are so many abandoned properties in the city of Camden. There are so many neglected properties in the city of Camden owned by out-of-state landlords who don't care for their properties. They need proper code enforcement. The people who live in the city, who own their residences, rent their residences, they're the ones we need to provide care and help for on an immediate basis. Thank you. Um, you represented in your testimony uh, a clear contradiction of a contention of the, the Chen Committee, the, the governor's panel, uh, that the benefits you've received, that, that the EDI, I think I, I see a quote over your right shoulder in one of your panels over there, mm -hmm. that there's been a, there has been a reassessment of the benefits that you've received and that contrary to the contention of the Chen Committee and the letter we received from their attorney, that that you didn't get tens of millions of dollars of benefits for companies that you control uh, by virtue of misrepresenting uh, the fact that jobs were going to leave here. And I think you said that if you, you do the math, the jobs you brought here completely offset. And I think you said game, set, match. Is that accurate? 100 percent. The uh, task force own report indicated that because we moved so many people from Philadelphia to Camden, which, by the way, when you look at the incentive program and awards throughout our state, you're not going to find many companies that brought people into New Jersey. Many of them received awards to retain employees in the state. Connor Strong left its corporate headquarters, national headquarters, at 1600 Market Street and moved to Camden, New Jersey, and consolidated our dual national headquarters subject to the tax credits. Therefore, any assertion about Connor Strong and Buckaloo is completely unfounded. And in the task force report, in of itself, admitted that. Hence, I termed it game, set, match. What's the point? We brought all these people. We invested the money. 
And by the way, Connor Strong and Buckaloo has already exceeded by 25% the number of employees we promised to bring to Camden and growing. Our company is growing dramatically, and we are putting those jobs in Camden, New Jersey. The, the public, though, and, and the press, uh, I guess, by in, in looking at some of the emails, et cetera, talking about uh, uh, jobs that, that may go to, to uh, Philadelphia, they, there seemed to be some smoke there. But you could see that, that now that you've put it in perspective, maybe there should be a, a better understanding. But it did look like, and, and I'll, I'll pivot right now, let's talk about the supermarket you mentioned. Uh, when I first heard about that, I made a public statement that there seemed to be a real concern there, that it seemed as if the Economic Opportunity Act uh, went beyond promoting bringing a supermarket to Camden, but also wanted to dissuade competition for a particular project by limiting the, the uh, lower end of square footage that could be permitted. You mentioned that the, the particular project in question had already gotten some tax incentives, didn't perform. But overall, that seemed to me to be a mistake. Why would we want to, to thread that needle? Why not, in a food desert like everyone agrees is Camden, why have the lower, why, why have the, the minimum number of square feet, particularly today when we have supermarket square footage going down below that minimum number now and even back then? Um, would you say that was a mistake to include the, that narrow and having a minimum amount of square footage required? Well, let, let me redoing it, we're, we're talking about redoing these, right. this legislation. Would you include the same restriction or no? Let me address that, and I'm glad you asked the question. I was a huge advocate of attempting to have ShopRite build a brand new supermarket in Camden, as was former Mayor Dana Redd, the council president, and now Mayor Frank Moran, virtually every elected official uh, in Camden and Camden County. The question became, which was never reported, the organization that complained about getting shut out Sorry. had previously been awarded, according to public records, $50 million incentive plan a year before any of this was ever discussed. And they pledged to begin construction immediately. Why would any change in anything matter when somebody held in their hand a $50 million grant to build a supermarket? And I'll tell you why. Because they didn't have a tenant. They had a grant, but they had no tenant. And in our neck of the woods, ShopRite is the most prominent supermarket chain that exists. And unfortunately, the manner in which they're organized their partners throughout the state all must consent and agree to new facilities. The local owner, the Rabbits family in Cherry Hill, had agreed to build this facility. They owned another facility in Pensauken a couple of miles away. We were thrilled. Mayor Dana Red announced the first supermarket coming to Camden after many, many, many years. And in the end, a decision was made by the parent company of ShopRite in New Jersey, I think it's called Wakefern, not to develop that project. And the one who had the $50 million award a year in advance, in advance of that, never moved a shovel of dirt. So how could that have been impaired? No way, shape, or form. That developer, regretfully, was unable to perform was probably seeking ShopRite as a tenant, couldn't get ShopRite, because ShopRite wanted the Admiral Wilson Boulevard location. Now, we were very dismayed that Wakefern ShopRite reneged on what was a public announcement that they made to locate at this site. To this day, I still don't know why they pulled out of the deal other than I was told that the parent company rejected the Rabbits family's application. Okay, thank you. Um, 
a topic that we have not yet touched on today. Uh, Holtec, one of the largest entities that has received uh, taxes and received, I think, the, the, the lion's share. I think you sit on that board. It's come to light that Holtec didn't disclose that they were debarred uh, at one point, and that disclosure, I believe, and you can correct me if you disagree with this, would have disqualified them from receiving uh, these tax incentives, or, or certainly could have. Um, when you became, when did you become aware of that? And when you did, what was the reaction? To sure. That? I serve on the board as an uncompensated member of their board of directors. No good deed goes it's a privately action. held firm. Holtec is one of two companies in the world that manufacture canisters to store spent nuclear fuel for 200 years. So as you can imagine, it's a pretty big concern. Dr. Chris Singh, the owner of that company, who started from scratch, uh, was contemplating what to do with his Pittsburgh and I believe Ohio facilities that helped to manufacture some of these. I spent several years trying to persuade him to move to Camden because to move these canisters, which are huge, and as you can imagine, weigh an enormous amount of money, you need waterway, you need rail transportation, because these are shipped all over the world, all over the world. As they decommission nuclear plants, they have to protect, obviously, the spent nuclear fuel. There was a company that I predicted, and I still will predict, in a decade will be the largest single employer of Camden residents in the city. For this reason, it's a huge manufacturing company. And in our country, manufacturing companies aren't tending to stay here. They've either left the country or they're contemplating other countries in which to manufacture. Dr. Singh agreed to move to Camden subject to the credits. Dr. Singh spent over $400 million of his own money, and I believe his award was 240, might have been 260, but he spent far more money than he received in awards. I know that he was being wooed by many other states as a matter of fact, he could have moved his business to any country in the world that had waterways, rail transportation, and otherwise. He's an American success story, a poor boy that came here from India and created this company and, and has been the author of over 100 patents and probably among the most cele uh, celebrated individuals in the nuclear field in the country. That application obviously misstated an important point that needed to be disclosed. I don't believe that even if they had stated it as a matter of law, an attorney would suggest that they would have not received the incentive awards for this reason. They were prevented from doing business at this authority, I think in Tennessee, for a very limited period of time, and that very authority awarded them hundreds of millions of dollars in new contracts. But let me make my point even clearer. If that had disqualified Holtec, what should Teva Pharmaceuticals been disqualified on? Bribing foreign governments? Manufacturing opioids that are killing members of our families? Our attorney general, our own attorney general, suing that company? That, to me, might be the basis in a review of tax incentive awards. Thank you. Uh, so last question, and you kind of brought us right back around to it, and you said you wonder why. Uh, there's been an enormous amount of investment in, in time, uh, in public money, uh, in investigating our tax incentive programs. Uh, and it's all kind of come down mainly to focus on the Camden region, on you, on, on your concerns. So why, when there are other entities that have perhaps committed far worse uh, uh, infractions, so you wonder why. What's your theory? Why have we wasted all this time uh, and ended up here? What's your theory? I think that's what they call a loaded question. Um, and let, in let me state admittedly this. so. 
I am here, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. I am here voluntarily today to answer any question anyone has. I believe in the city of Camden. I've spent my entire life, as did my parents and grandparents, my brothers, extended members of our family, and those that are part of the renaissance and rebuilding of this city. For the first time in 50 years, it's actually happening. We have gone through some difficult times in the last six or seven months. I pointed out how few companies are receiving the material publicity that have happened to those companies in Camden and companies that I admittedly and enthusiastically recruited to come to Camden. Mayor Red, Mayor Moran regularly referred to me as Camden's cheerleader, which is exactly what I am because I am there to try and encourage and sell people on coming. We've gotten some major enterprises, and I've mentioned some of their names. The Campbell Soup Company, during the latter part of the Corzine administration, contemplated leaving Camden. Fortunately, that administration, the County of Camden and others, pitched in to work with the Campbell Soup Company to retain it in Camden, its home for 150 years. MD Anderson Cancer Center, which I've always described as the greatest cancer center in the galaxy, chose as one of its first, first satellite partnership facilities outside of Houston, the city of Camden, America's most dangerous and poorest city. They did it because they had confidence in the collective leadership, the governor, the leadership of the legislature, and others to be part of something with its medical school, its medical research, and to provide badly needed comprehensive cancer care in the seven southern counties, which lacked not a single comprehensive cancer center. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate your uh, candor and your comprehensive responses. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Any other questions? If not, let me thank you very much for coming in today. We appreciate the information you provided. This is uh, Rabbi Slotnick. Rabbi Slotnick, president of Missouri. Or one minute. Had so many fans? Did George know he had so many fans? One more minute. You should be. I'm sure. Uh, now you're making me uh, envious. I'm not sure. just like you. No problem. <laughs> Katie, it's 
characterization was false. I thought you we asked, were addressing. Yeah, no. I, I, yeah. yeah. I wasn't predicting that he was false. Yeah. Would the uh, people leaving the room be quiet? Rabbi, my apologies. A uh, little noisier than it should be.